All right, so before we get into talking about um, pain management meds and options for pain management, I wanna talk a little bit about movement and monitoring because they kind of go hand in hand, right? So when you're thinking about what kind of experience you wanna have in birth, I think it's important to consider how much movement is important to you, right? So how much you wanna be able to be up out of the bed, moving around and monitoring. So those things all kind of tie in, right? So think about how important is it to you to be able to stand up, walk around during labor? You know, if you're there for a couple of hours, several hours, 20 hours, is it important to you to be able to stand up, move around, walk, squat, dance, you know, whatever feels good? If that is really important to you, then you may want to try some of the more natural options first, right? Not to say that you can't get an epidural, that you shouldn't get an epidural, but to know that once you start introducing pain management medications, that you'll probably be confined to your bed, right? So those are things to consider. And I'll go into a little bit more detail when we start talking about the specific pain management medication options. Um, but, you know, having an idea of what kind of movement you want to be able to have. And are you going to be like wanting to listen to your body and maybe sit on the toilet for a little while or do some squatting or do some lunges? You know, all of these things, movement is so good for your labor progressing. Um, you want to be moving. All those things are helping the baby to engage, helping the baby to make her way down, um, helping her to stay in the right position, helping your body continue opening. And if you haven't had any drugs, then you can really feel kind of feel into what's going on in your body and adjust, you know, to kind of see what feels right in the moment, you know? Okay. So the, in terms of monitoring as well, I think it's important that we address what kind of monitoring to expect. So I think we're all pretty familiar with the most common protocol type of monitoring, which is continuous electronic fetal, to, fetal monitoring. So we're talking about when you have that band across your belly, right? Across your abdomen, where they're checking the baby's heart rate that way. Um, it's just really the most common way for the baby's heart rate to be monitored during birth. Um, it is continuous, it is electric, and it limits your mobility. So it's important to know that, you know, it might be a little bit more challenging to get up, to move around, to go to the bathroom, which you wanna be doing when you're in labor. You wanna be using the toilet every hour and trying to pee every hour. Um, so knowing that if you're, you're, if you're having the continuous electronic fetal monitoring and it's, you know, the belt attached to your stomach, it can be more challenging to have that freedom of movement. Now, do you have options? Yes. And that's what I want to talk about because I don't think a lot of people realize that you have additional options when it comes to monitoring. So even though that's the most common type and it is um, pretty helpful for moms who may be higher risk, you know, and, and really, especially if you've had some type of pain management meds, if you haven't, or if you have a lower risk birth or a lower risk pregnancy, you may consider other monitoring options. Um, okay, so an example, I'm sure we've all seen kind of the super old school stethoscope, right? So this is not electric, it's super simple, um, but just, you know, kind of that goes in your ears like the kid's toy, it looks like the kid's toy, right? Really basic, but you can actually listen to a heart rate that way. So that's an option for lower risk situations that if you don't want to be confined or limited in movement, you may ask, you know, what are my options for using a stethoscope or a Doppler is another option. So Doppler is something you've probably experienced at your prenatal visits. So when they put a little bit of that jelly stuff on your tummy and rub that thing across your stomach and you can kind of hear the heartbeat in the room, right? So that's kind of a Doppler. And that's also something that they can do here and there without it being continuous, that they can continue to monitor the baby's heart rate and give you that freedom of mobility. So that's something to consider that may be of interest to you as well. A couple of other options. Um, this is really going to vary by hospital and by location, depending on where you're located. But if it's something that's of interest to you, then certainly ask when you go on the hospital tour. And if you haven't done your hospital tour, please do the hospital tour because it's very important that you get a feel for kind of what they're, what is available to you there and how can they best support the kind of birth that you want to have. So wireless electronic fetal monitoring is sometimes available, waterproof, or even intermittent. So what I mean by intermittent is that, you know, maybe they take it off of you so that it's not continuous, so that you can have breaks and say, okay, let's agree to every this many minutes, I'll come back and I'll let you do the monitoring with the electronic system. But in between, I wanna have the mobility to be able to move around. That could be an option too, 
right? So those are just a couple of things to consider. Wireless and waterproof, wireless for obvious reasons because you can get up and move around. Waterproof would be super cool if you are interested in any kind of um, use of water for pain management. So, uh, hey Bella, this hospital no longer does tours. What? What do you mean they don't do tours? How is that possible? Where do you live again? Remind me, because I can't remember. I know you've been in the group for a long time. I feel like you're in the Southeast, like me. Um, so yeah, and, you know, if you're considering using water, um, like one of the hospitals here locally, they have waterproof wireless monitors that you can actually like labor in the tub, labor in the shower, and still be having, you know, continuous monitoring. Thank you. What's up, Camille? Um, oh yeah, that's right, you are in New York. They don't do tours? You're kidding me. Like, that is ridiculous. That really irks me. Um, although I do know New York just started doing that. Um, they have this, you know, new doula initiative. Are you familiar with it? Or have you heard anything about it? And I think I missed your last comment yesterday that you said you were going to um, do your training, your doula training. Is that right? Okay, so monitoring options, right? So you have additional options. So if you are on the lower risk end of your you know, pregnancy or birth and you're considered low risk and you may want the mobility, if that's part of your birth plan or something that you wanna feel during your birth, I would suggest and urge you to talk to your provider and talk to um, the hospital You know, when you do the tour to find out what other options you have for monitoring so that if you don't want to be stuck to the bed that you may not have to be right? Um, and you know, the a little side note about the continuous electronic fetal monitoring systems that we all kind of know that belt around the tummy is they're not always perfectly accurate and sometimes can give false readings. Not to say that, you know, they're a bad thing. They're not a bad thing. They're doing a good, a great thing, right? But I do think that sometimes people can get false readings. And so it can be a little bit uh, like a lot of things in pregnancy, you know, right? There's a lot of times in pregnancy where we get false false readings or something odd shows up on an ultrasound. I mean, I've been having these conversations with moms a lot lately about these scares, you know, that can come up and later that things end up being okay. Um, not always, right? Because there's, there's things that come up. Um, but yeah, so if, you're, if you are interested in that, there are some articles um, that I'm happy to share with you that talk about really how effective and how reliable the monitoring systems really are. So just something else to consider. Okay, now when we go back to freedom of mobility. Now, if you, I talk a lot about movement during labor and how important it is for your progression of your labor. Um, and if things that, and if you're like, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't know what you mean because all you've ever seen on TV are women who go to the hospital when their water breaks, they get hooked up to the machines, they get an IV and they lay in the bed and they get cut off from all food. That doesn't have to be the case for you. You don't have to do it that way, right? So you do have options. Um, I'm talking about freedom to walk. Maybe you wanna walk the halls of the hospital in between contractions, right? Maybe you wanna dance. I mean, we've all seen those dance uh, videos going around that people are dancing in labor. I love it. Like, I'm all here for it. I wasn't able to dance in labor because my ish got real quick, and so I didn't have a chance to really have fun and dance, but I love seeing moms that move around, even though the song is annoying to, as hell to me, but I think it's so cute, and I love the movement because it's so good for your body. It's so good for your labor progression to keep that movement going, right? Um, going to the bathroom. If you want to be able to just get up and go to the bathroom, then some of these monitoring systems can really make that um, impossible because you're, you'll be confined to the bed and you'll have a catheter in depending on you know what, what route you take. So just some other things to consider. If you want to be able to go up and sit and labor on the toilet for a while, you know, then you might consider alternative forms of monitoring. Let me address this real quick. I would love the doula program. I'm 32 weeks and I've had the hardest time finding a reasonable one. And yes, I'm going to do my training as soon as I'm back on my feet. I love that because it's so needed. Um, you know what? Let me. You'll have to message me and tell me what area of New York you're in because I remember looking it up for one time, one time for a lady. Um, and I know that there's an initiative out right now. Um, so yeah, definitely. I know there's volunteer programs too. And New York is one of the bigger areas because the statistics are so bad in New York. Um, there's such shit, really. Like the statistics for women of color it, it, giving birth in New York, it's 
awful. It's absolutely awful. And so they're finally stepping it up and trying to do something. And so the doula initiatives are part of that um, to have that continuous support during labor um, because it's, I mean, it'll make you sick to your stomach if you start, you know, reading about it and really seeing what's going on, um, which if you've given birth, have you given birth in New York before? Or is this your first time in New York? Yeah, it's bad, isn't it? It's bad. It's, it's, it's shameful. Truly, like, it's embarrassing to be an American when you read some of that stuff. You, I just, you know, it's, it's bad. Um, so y your work will be so needed up there, like so needed. Okay. Um, all right. So other things, when you talk about moving around during labor, if you can get access to a yoga ball or a birth ball, and most big hospitals have them. And so you can request that. And if you haven't been limited in uh, movement by your monitoring systems, then you can use the yoga ball, which is so good for your labor. Bounce on it, rotate your hips, you know, do some stretches. I leaned over mine on the side of the bed when I was in labor. It's amazing to keep opening things up, opening your pelvis up and giving you that support. And then also just moving positions. If you have this monitoring strap, you know, attached to your stomach and you start moving around, bouncing around, it really makes it difficult. So moving positions is something that can really help the baby too, to get in the best position. So sometimes if a labor appears to be slowing down, stalling or whatnot, it could just be a positioning thing. And sometimes just mom moving around and trying different positions can really help the baby to move and to get in a better position for birth, right? So when you talk about being limited in mobility, those things impact your labor, right? Oh, it's your fifth labor in New York. Okay. I would love to hear about your first four experiences because I'm a birth nerd and because I've heard stories and I know how scary it's been for a lot of women, uh, for black women who give birth in New York. And it's, it's freaking awful. I mean, I've heard it's really, really bad. Let me take a sip of water because my throat is still jacked up. And I was just singing in the car. So I really like horse myself out here. I shouldn't sing before lives. I sound awful, but I was singing because the kids weren't in the car. So I was listening to whatever I wanted. And, um, you know, usually I kind of go all in. You can always tell when a mom is like riding alone in her car by herself, right? Because there's no like Daniel Tiger on, there's none of that stuff. I put whatever I want on and I'm loud. I'm so loud. Okay. So now we talked a little bit about uh, mobility and about monitoring. So this all ties into, you know, the decisions that you're making and the options that you have when you're considering your pain management um, options, right? And what pain management options you want to choose, whether they're natural or meds or the drugs. I'm going to talk a little bit about the natural options first, and then I'll get to the drugs. Um, not for any reason, just that's the way I'm doing it. So I mentioned a little bit about water, water therapy. So <clears throat> if you've never tried this before, um, when you're in labor, a lot of moms really love the feeling of water, whether you're in the tub, in the shower, sometimes if you're having a particularly bad back labor, just having that hot shower water hit you in the back can be super soothing, right? And can feel so good for moms. Um, I know personally, and then it also can vary by birth. So with my second birth, I was with my second labor, I was trying to labor at home as long as possible when I was preparing for my VBAC, my first VBAC. And this was two and a half years ago. So I'm in the tub at our house I was in the tub for probably three hours because it felt so good. I kept letting the water run down and because it was getting cold. So I'd let the water run out and then keep refilling with hotter water. It felt very good for me. It brought my pain level down big time. So this last bird that I had five months ago, my labor was intensifying quick. And I thought, shit, I need to slow this down until my doula gets here. Let me get in the tub and try to calm myself down a little bit, you know, manage this pain a little bit. It had the opposite effect on me this time right? So the reason I'm telling you that is because if water is something that's of interest to you, don't be discouraged if in the moment it's not feeling so good. Like baths, I mean, hands down, I think all of us can agree that baths are pretty calming and relaxing, right? But there may be moments and there may be certain births that it doesn't feel so good. Or maybe you don't want your hair wet or it's annoying um, or you're too hot or you're too cold. It's really hard to tell how you're going to feel ahead of time. But if you want to consider having that as an option to you, then you also need to be, you know, um, conscious of what decisions you're making for monitoring as well, right? So if you're like, hey, when I get to the hospital, I'm going to ask for a room that has a laboring tub, or I'm going to ask for a room that has a shower. Hopefully it's available to me. And in that case, can I use the wireless or the waterproof monitoring? Or can I try a stethoscope where I get out of the water every so often, you check baby's heart rate, and then I get back in? Something like that, right? So those are just kind of scenarios and ideas to play around with. Um, 
Another natural pain management option, this is huge, this is probably the biggest thing, is breathing and relaxation exercises. So if nothing else, if you remember nothing else, even if you're gonna get the drugs, even if you're gonna get an epidural, no judgment zone here, but there will be a period of time that you're in labor before you get them, right? So during that time, if you remember nothing else, focus on your breathing. And I talked to a lot of moms, and I was guilty of it too, that the knee-jerk reaction, if you don't know, which I didn't know any better until somebody told me, so now all I do is talk about it, but if, if you don't know, your knee-jerk reaction, when, well, mine, when I was in pain, and a lot of moms, is to kind of clench up and tighten and hold your breath, right? So when I'm at the dentist and I'm getting dental work done, I clench that damn seat so hard. Like I grip my fingers into the side of the chair because I hate the dentist and I hate the feeling, I hate the pain, I have very sensitive teeth um, and I clench up like a mad person and I catch myself and I'm like, geez, I'm like digging holes into this chair with my fingernails right now. Um, and I did the same thing with my first birth and that is like the opposite of what is good for your birth and to relax you. So if you think about taking a deep breath, right? Focus on your breathing. And I'm not gonna really like practice breathing techniques with you because I feel like there's a ton of them you can Google on YouTube if you want. Um, but what I feel is that in the moment, breathe how it, how what with what feels right to you. Just always go back to your breath. Practice deep breaths while you're pregnant. Practice deep breaths when you're upset. Practice deep breaths with your kids. I have my two-year-old doing this now and it is the cutest thing. Because when she gets all worked up, I tell her, okay, let's take a deep breath. And she goes, when I have her do her hands, and it's so freaking cute. If y'all saw her on my Instagram live yesterday, I'm like, I mean, my um, just IG video that I did with her, she's so cute. I could just eat her. But she does this, like we do deep breathing, and she'll go. And so focusing on your breath, I mean, it has a scientific effect on your relaxation, you know, the state of your body's relaxation. So it is truly, you know, um, a thing. Erica, I feel like my immediate reaction to pain is crying, but I really want to try to be relaxed and breathe through everything instead of crying. I totally get that. I totally get that. But if you need to cry, cry. That's okay too. If you need to yell or groan or moan like a lion. Girl, I was roaring like a lion here when I had her on the floor a couple months ago. Like I, I was surprised my neighbors didn't call somebody because I was so loud. And I just have to let it out. And I have heard that some hospitals, some doctors, some nurses can be really uncomfortable with women make it, making a ton of noise during labor because they're so used to their protocol. They're so used to giving women epidural and Pitocin, which isn't a terrible thing, but that's just what they're used to. So they're not used to seeing this natural process of people letting out the emotion, crying, yelling, moaning breathing loud, whatever you need to do, do what feels comfortable and hopefully nobody says anything to you. Hypnobirthing thoughts. So I studied hypnobabies with my last, you know, with my third one, right? I, I think you were around in my group when I was talking about it. So I did study it. I was not the best student um, because, and I love to study and read and learn. I'm, you know, a hardcore birth nerd, but I wasn't the best at it because when you're really, really taking hypnobirthing or hypnobabies seriously, you're supposed to use very specific language when you're describing things like contractions. So even contractions, they don't recommend you use that word because there's a little bit of a negative connotation to the word or pain. So they suggest you use words like pressure wave instead of contraction, which is great. I like the word, but I teach this stuff right? So I can't not say contractions because I'm surrounded by women who all they know is the word contractions. So I use the word contractions. That and when I would listen to the hypnotist, um, the hypno, hypno babies tracks at night, I love the tracks, but I love them so much that I could not keep my eyes open. Like the second I put those things, if you have a hard time sleeping, listen to some hypno babies tracks or some hypno birthing tracks. That should put you right out. Like when I was pregnant, that was my golden ticket for going to sleep. But then I couldn't tell if I was remembering what I was hearing. You know, I wasn't getting the full experience. And I know a lot of it goes into your subconscious anyways. So, the, you know, that's the whole point of the hypno birthing, the hypno babies, the affirmation tracks is to get it into your subconscious, which can happen when you're sleeping. It does happen while you're sleeping. But I think I may have fallen asleep too much. Like I never stayed awake for any of it. So I do still really like the Hypno Babies program. Um, I don't think that I was fully hypnotized during my birth because um, I just wasn't that great of a student. I could not keep my eyes open, y'all. Like for nothing. 
It does. <laughs> I mean, it's a good program though. And it relaxed me. If I was upset or worked up or, you know, at the end of pregnancy, you have so much anxiety. If I would get in the tub and put the hypno, uh, you know, the hypno babies affirmations tracks on, it's like 45 minutes. It was very good at relaxing me. I mean, I fell asleep in the tub a couple times too. It's just kind of dangerous, but, um, you know, the affirmations tracks, it's super, super relaxing. So I do think that it's a really good program. And I've seen a lot of people that it's worked really, really well for um, in terms of how they manage pain. Oh, it worked for you? Yeah. And you know what? And that may have been another big contributing. I, I did experience pain. I felt pain. And I have seen a lot of moms that went through the Hypno Babies programs and did not feel pain during their birth. I did feel pain. So I wasn't completely, you know, hypnotized to where I didn't feel any pain and I didn't experience it, but it may have helped me to cope. It may have helped me in the moment. And so I did have my hypnosis tracks playing in my early labor here until things got really crazy. And then I don't even know what happened to my phone. I don't know what happened to my life. Um, it's like when you go to a party in college and you're like, all of a sudden something switched and you're like, I don't know what happened past whatever time. Like things get foggy. I don't know where my phone went. I don't know who, you know, was trying to reach out to me. So that was kind of how the end of my labor went. Like I didn't even know what was going on. I was in labor land, like hardcore in my head. But I do think it's really helpful. I think it's a good program. All right, so some more natural options, um, changing positions. We talked a little bit about that, but that's really good, even for helping relieve some of your pain, just moving sometimes and helping the baby to get off a certain spot. Uh, the use of a rebozo, which is that Mexican scarf that we talked about yesterday. And if you're interested, I suggest going on Spinning Baby's website. They have a lot of information on how to use a rebozo. You can get rebozos on Amazon if that's something that you know is of interest to you. Aromatherapy, so we're talking essential oils. Um, and if you're gonna be birthing at a hospital, you probably can't bring your diffuser. Um, but a, a suggestion that I always make for moms is put some on a cotton ball and put them in a Ziploc baggie. So that way in the moment, if you're enjoying it, you can use it. But if in the moment you're like, oh, I can't smell that right now, because you know when you're, you're still pregnant when you're in labor, and so some smells will drive you nuts at different points. At least it's in a cotton ball, put it in the bag, and get it out of the room. So, and that's a way you can bring aromatherapy into the hospital. So that's an option. Acupressure, so there are pressure points on your body that can actually help to relieve some of your labor pain. Right, And so again, this is one of those things that I'm happy to share a link. I have a lot of those resources on my website too, uh, but there are pressure points and those are things that you can talk through with your partner or if you're working with a doula, you can make sure that they're aware that that's something you wanna try. So those are options. Massage, right? And it sounds so simple, but you know, if you've got a tennis ball at home, um, you can take a tennis ball and put it behind your back and just kind of rub yourself, you know, rub up against the back of a chair, up against the wall. You know, what you can do with a massage, you know, with a tennis ball to massage your back um, really can be helpful to manage labor pains in a natural way. Um, and if you have any of those little handheld massagers, or I've seen people that like to have their hair brushed, right? So get a hairbrush and something relaxing to help take your mind off of it just for that one minute, right? Because I think a lot of people forget that when you're in labor and you're experiencing contraction pain, the pain is during the contraction, which is usually about a minute, right? And so in between the contractions, you're not really in pain, you're recovering. So if you can find something that works for you for that one minute, then you're gonna get a break. And then you find something that works for another minute and then you get a break, right? Okay, hypnosis, we talked about hot, cold therapy. So hot rags, you know, if you're cold, sometimes people like to put a nice warm, wet rag on their stomach. Um, I would be cautious at using heating pads, particularly if you've had an epidural, because then you, your skin might not feel how hot it is. So I would caution against that. But cold packs, a lot of moms love having a cold pack on their forehead, on the back of their neck, if you get worked up. Um, actually, I didn't even remember this about my labor, but my husband had set up the iPad to record part of my labor here, and I didn't even know he was doing it. So I got the videos from him like a couple weeks after this last birth. And at one point in one of the videos, I leaned back after a contraction, I was kind of catching my breath and I was pointing up to him and I was pointing at the ceiling fan because I was hot. And I hear him say, what, what? And I said, the fan, the fan. And I didn't even remember saying that, but I guess in the moment I was hot. And so, and then I've also experienced, you know, I had a doula my second birth that was applying cold packs to my forehead and it felt so good. 
So, you know, you, you, those are things that you can explore too. Um, counter pressure. So this is a tool that a lot of doulas use. And if you are not working with a doula, you can get tips and you can see actually how to do it in my classes on my website. Um, but counter pressure, we're talking like a hip squeeze. So somebody who's with you might take their hands and actually put them on like by your butt and squeeze in, right? So a lot of that pressure during contractions can really help to alleviate that pain just for that one minute during the contraction. So those are a lot of really great natural options, things that you can consider. Um, there's a lot more detail in the class on my website called Coping with Contractions. It's kind of like a DIY daddy doula class. It's for free on my library, my video class library, so go check it out. Um, but those, that's just kind of an overview. All right, so I do wanna get into the pain management meds options too. I wanna to talk about the drugs. Um, I'm gonna talk about the three most common options. And then if you have questions, feel free to add them as we go. I will try to you know, check them as I go. All right, the first one I wanna talk about is nitrous oxide gas. So if you're unfamiliar with it, if you've ever been to the dentist and maybe had your wisdom teeth pulled, they may have given you that nitrous oxide, right? And it makes you feel kind of dopey and drunk a little bit. It takes the edge off. It's not a painkiller, but it takes the edge off and helps you to relax. This is the same concept, except it's not as strong as what they give you at the dentist. So it's a little bit lighter. Uh, the benefit to using nitrous oxide is it doesn't cross the placenta, so it does not affect the baby, right? It doesn't get into the baby's body. Um, it is inhaled through that mask, and so if you're not enjoying it and it's something that's bothering you, you just take it off and you just don't do it again, right? So some moms have said it makes them feel we, um, nauseous, uh, something like that, and so if you're not liking the way it feels, it's easy to take it off and then you just don't use it again, right? So a lot of moms really like nitri nitrous oxide um, because it's it's not you know super high commitment and it doesn't affect the placenta or the body's natural uh, physiological birth process, all right? So the next option is a systemic medication. And so what I mean by that is that it affects your entire system, okay? So this would be a shot um, that you get. An example would be like fentanyl or statol. statol. Um, it's, it's a shot that you would get that would just affect your whole body. Now, it's not a painkiller either. This is also something that just takes the edge off. I have had one of these. I had one after my third birth when I was getting some blood clots pulled out and I was hemorrhaging. I did get, I think I got fentanyl, um, but she gave me the shot in my leg and it just took the edge off. I still felt, I still experienced pain when she pulled some clots out, um, but it definitely relaxed me and took the edge off. Now they don't last as long. So this is something that's just gonna last an hour to an hour and a half, but it's an option, right? The downside is of course it can, it, can affect the baby because it can cross the placenta. This is a drug that's being injected into your body. So it can affect the baby. It can affect the baby's heart rate, breathing. Um, you know, it can affect your labor progress. It, it can have those impact. Always? No, not always, but can it? Yeah, so it's important to know, right? Um, and it's not something that's going to remove all the pain. It's not a complete, you know, pain blocker. Right, so it's just taking the edge off and helping to relax you. Um, keep in mind too, if you do get the systemic medication injection, you will be confined to the bed, and you will be set up with an IV. Right, so keep that in mind that we talked about at the beginning of this live. Um, if if movement and mobility is super important to you, then the systemic meds may be something that you hold off on or try to you know forego. Right. Nurturing dreamer. I wish nitrous was available at all hospitals and birthing centers. Yeah, I know. I know. I do too. And you know, if that's something that's of interest to you, definitely start checking. And that's why when you go on the hospital tour, find out what your options are. Um, and if, you know, if it's super important and you're able to find another location that has it, you know, you could always consider that route too. Right? Uh, but yeah, I do wish it was available. I feel like it's becoming more widespreadly available, but it's not everywhere yet. Right? Okay, so now the last one I wanna talk about is the most common and most effective pain management drug, the epidural, right? The all everything epidural. Okay, epidurals are regional. So the systemic we just talked about affect your whole system. Epidural is regional, meaning it will only affect that particular region, right? So the epidural is injected through a catheter in your spinal cord, you know, in your spinal column, right? Um, and it, and I know people are freaked out about the needle and it is, 
not a comfortable thing to get an epidural injection. It's not a fun thing, um, but some people love them. I mean, I've had two, and the second one I had was pretty amazing. It's very effective, can be very effective. Sometimes it's not. So there are women that the epidural just doesn't work or it only works on one side or doesn't completely take. Um, there can be complications with epidurals. So those are things that you know you wanna keep in mind too when you're making these decisions. Um, okay, but generally they are the most effective pain management medication. Now, keep in mind too, obviously, if you're going to get an epidural, that you will be confined to the bed. So this is another one of those things that if you get epidural, you will be set up with an IV um, of fluids, you will be hooked up to continuous fetal monitoring, and you will have a catheter placed because you won't be able to get up and go to the bathroom, so you'll have a bladder catheter placed, and then you'll have a pump. So when you have the epidural, you have a pump that you can control how much you're getting. So you can even have like a light epidural, right? And just try a little bit and see how you feel. And if you want more, you can pump for more up to a certain amount, right? It cuts you off at a certain amount because they're not gonna let you get completely haywire. Um, downsides, you know, it can affect the baby, right? So the epidural is a drug that does cross the placenta, does get into the baby's bloodstream, can affect breastfeeding, can affect the baby's heart rate, can affect their breathing. Um, it can have all of those effects. It can also lead to other interventions. Why? Because when you have an epidural, it, it stops the body's natural physiological birth process. So your natural hormones are no longer going to be released once you get the epidural. An epidural can slow, it's a drug. It can you know, it's it's a drug, a pain management medication drug, so it slows everything down. So if you slow your labor down with a drug and now you're on this stopwatch, you know, your doctor's watch and they're wanting things to be happening at a certain rate, which don't always happen at their rate, right? If they want to speed things back up, what a lot of doctors will suggest is getting you started on Pitocin because Pitocin will stimulate things to pick back up. Right, and so then you start saying, okay, now I've had epidural, it slowed things down. I got Pitocin to speed things back up, but now it hurts again. So I'm gonna pump for more epidural, then it slows things down. Then you get a little more Pitocin to speed things back up. And then you continue on that cycle, right? So that's why for some women, it can really turn into that cascade of interventions where you know it can affect the baby's heart rate, it can slow the baby down, you know, making their descend into your birth canal. It can. Does it always happen? No, but can it? Yeah, it can. Okay. Hey, Victoria. I had an epidural with my first and second. My legs tingled for like a whole day after my first. It was perfection with my second though, really shooting for a natural for number three. You know, um, my epidural with my first for the C-section, um, my calf, like the lower half of my left leg was numb for months. I want to say it may have been close to a year that it was just numb to the touch. It didn't hurt, but it was numb to the touch, which is really freaky. You know, it's really frightening. And I didn't even notice until I was trying to shave my legs one day after I had the baby. And I was like, weird, I can't feel anything right there. And it took a long time. It ended up coming back. Thighs felt like they were asleep. Yeah. And you know, and with my second, I had a fantastic experience with epidural. Like I'm not going to knock epidurals. It in total, right, as a whole, because I had a great experience with it my second. I was in a lot of pain. I had labored um, very intensely for about five hours, which isn't that long, but I didn't get much of a break. And um, once I got the epidural, I was able to relax. And luckily, my body continued to open up. I did not need to be on Pitocin. Uh, my contractions stayed consistent. My body kept opening, the baby kept coming down, and I had a great experience. And I didn't tear, I didn't need other, invention, other interventions. Um, having said that, the statistics do show that when you have an epidural, that you do have a higher chance at needing other interventions, that you do have a higher chance at things like, you know, and other interventions include things like a cesarean. That is absolutely an intervention. So you, and you know, episiotomies or, you know, tearing because you're introducing all these other interventions like forceps, those increase your risk and the degree to which you might tear. So those are all things that can play into um, each other. And I also believe that when you get the epidural it makes a difference right? So if you get the epidural as soon as possible, that can make a big difference, right? Whereas if you say, let me see if I can delay this for a little while and see how long I can kind of manage this on my own with some of these natural options and get to a certain point where I'm like, okay, I'm ready, right? Not that you say you need it, but that you want it because that's you taking control versus feeling like it's that you're not in control. So see how it sounds different to say like, I needed the epidural. That doesn't sound like you're it doesn't feel to me like I'm in control when I'm saying that. But if I say, I wanted the epidural, 
I'm in control and that's my decision. And that's a different feeling for me. So yeah, that's just like a little side note. Um, hey Jazz, what's up? Why does epidural make you itch and sweaty? I've noticed it with both births. Um, that's a side effect. Yeah, it's a it's a common side effect. I was super itchy after my first epidural. My second one I wasn't, but my first, yeah, hardcore. I mean, you, I was digging the skin off my legs. It's a side effect. There are a lot of side effects to epidural. Um, there's some, you know, common ones that are more common, like itchy or nausea or, you know, things like that. And then there's some super rare, but also, you know, quite um, significant side effects, right? Um, really things that can be pretty, pretty frightening. Um, and they're rare, but they, they can happen. Hemorrhoids. Sheesh, I couldn't feel anything. And all I was told was to push. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, that's, and that's the worst. And so, you know, if you're thinking about getting an epidural, um, you know, you may consider, like I was saying, delay it a little bit, right? Or even start with a little and see how you feel you know, and see how you're feeling until you start pumping it more. Um, maybe have it placed and only pump as you need it because the more you can feel what's going on and when you start talking about pushing, you know, then you can really um, hope to minimize other interventions, right? If you can really feel everything that's going on and if you can try to let your body open up and progress as much as possible before intervening with pain management drugs. So maybe if you say, you know, just an option, just a different scenario, like let me try this, 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 and then when I'm ready, then I'll get an epidural. And maybe I won't, maybe I won't want one, right? You never know. You ended up having hemorrhoidal surgery months after. I'd rather the pain, oh God. Yeah, that's so, mm, that's, and was that, did you have tearing too? Did you have surgery for that? Cause God, that sounds, awful. And you know, the pain from pushing, here's the thing about the pain from pushing from my own experience, pushing out a baby naturally, it hurts. I'm not going to lie. Like it's painful. You're pushing something large out of somewhere, not so large. It's grown and stretched, but it's still painful. But as soon as they come out, the pain is gone. Like that's it. That's it. Just an episiotomy. Okay. And see, that's, that's a recovery too. Like, you know, you're going to be recovering from that too. So yeah. Um, and a few little tips about epidural too is other things to consider. And this is not necessarily about knowing your options, but since we're talking about epidural, you know, you may consider using a peanut ball. So I did that in my second labor and I always recommend moms, if you're going to have an epidural, please ask for the peanut ball because you're going to be stuck in the bed and you can stick that peanut ball right in between your knees and shift from side to side to continue opening your pelvis. You want things to keep opening up right? And you don't have to push lay flat on your back just because you had an epidural. You can incline up a little bit. You can do side lying position, especially if you have people there with you, your partner, your mom, whoever is your support person, hopefully a doula um, holding your leg. The peanut ball does a great job at holding your leg in the perfect position. So if you wanted to push on your side, you know, after you've had an epidural, that's doable. You just need to ask and advocate for yourself and find out, you know, who's around that can help you with that, right?